Hello. Hello. Host. Hello. Hello. Good afternoon, ma. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon. Okay. We have twenty perspect. Uh, we have twenty participants. Yes. I'm this is two o'clock. Hello. Yes. So do we do we wait or are we starting? So we can start now. I am Hello. our panelist. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon. Okay. We have twenty perspect. Uh, we have twenty participants. Yes. Yes. This is two o'clock. Yeah, we can Hello. start now. Okay. So we... It seems there's a delay in the time, though. I mean, in the audio. Hello. Hello. Good afternoon. Uh, okay. Good afternoon. Okay. We have 20%. Uh, good afternoon, colleagues, senior colleagues and colleagues. Um, my name is Olufumulala Ogun from University College Hospital Ibadan, and I'm pleased to invite you uh, to welcome you to this, the sixth YOF uh, quarterly webinar. Today we have an exciting presentation. Uh, in which we will be discussing the ophthalmic nerve head evaluation from the perspectives of the glaucoma uh, physician, as well as from the perspectives of the neuroophthalmologist. And we have two important speakers today. Um, can the host please put up the bios of our speakers? So the first speaker is Dr. Dara Mosu, she's a fellow of the Nigerian Postgraduate Medical College with an interest in neuroophthalmology and glaucoma. She works at the New National Hospital in Abuja. Her hobbies are reading and traveling, and she will be talking about the glaucoma perspective of optic nerve head evaluation. And she will speak for 20 minutes. Second speaker is Dr. Hashia Kana. She is a researcher at the Gillings School of Public Health, Global Public Health at the University of North Carolina in the US. This is around 9 a.m. for her. She is a team member on a project developing um, a device for the detection, an algorithm for the detection of trichiasis. That's from the public health perspective. But with respect to Neuroophthalmology, she has had a short neuroophthalmology observership at the Duke Eye Center, Durham, in North Carolina. So she will be speaking about the neuroophthalmic perspectives of optic nerve head evaluation. Without further delay, may I welcome to the to, to share her speech, Dr. Habibat Daramosu. Dr. Daramoso, are you online? I'm online. Good afternoon, man. All right. You're welcome. So I, I hand over to you. You will speak for 20 minutes. Um, I don't know if you want to start with a poll, but I'd like to invite all our participants to kindly take down any questions that they have. We will have a question and answer session at the end. We will also have a short, um, short address by the president of the YOF at the end of this uh, meeting. And just to note that there will be a special question sometime during the course of this event where there will be a prize that will be given out. So please stay tuned and enjoy the talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ma. Good afternoon, okay. everyone. You're welcome to today's um, webinar of the Young Ophthalmologist Forum. Today we'll be talking about the optic nerve head evaluation, and I'll be discussing the glaucoma perspective. I'm Dr. Abibat Deremusu. I'd like to use the whole... Uh, sorry? I'd like to use the... Just, just a moment. May, sorry. May I just mention here that um, we also have the chat section where you can type questions. 
Sorry, I didn't mention that. And then during the time when we have polls, you will also see a link to vote that goes to the participants. Thank you. Over to you, Dr. Daramusu. Thank you, Ma. I'd like to use the hotline you can see presently on the screen, the introduction, the normal optic nerve head, and we'll talk about the evaluation of the optic nerve head in terms of identification of the disc boundaries and estimation of the size of the disc. Changes in the peripapillary area, we'll talk about the cup disc ratio and the ring disc ratio, talk about evaluation of the new retinal ring, disc image, and the nerve fiber, nerve, retinal nerve fiber layer assessment. There will also be a quiz at the end of the session. By way of introduction, glaucoma is a group of neurodegenerative diseases which is characterized by progressive optic neuropathy, retinal ganglion cell death with a CETA visual defect, for which intraocular pressure is a major modifiable risk factor. This is a leading cause of irreversible blindness, and it's also not of note to say it's almost it's also the most preventable cause of blindness. Glaucoma is the most common cause of optic neuropathy. The human optic nerve consists of approximately 1.2 to 1.5 million atoms of the retinal ganglion cells. The nerve fiber layer of this, in the nerve, retinal nerve fiber layer, these atoms they converge from every direction towards the optic disc, and then they enter the optic disc through the choroscleral canal. The fibers emanating from the nasal retina they enter the nasal aspect of the disc, while we have the temporal fibers hacking over the macular area to enter into the superior and inferior poles. And then the papillomacular bundle goes directly from the macular area to the optic disc. This is a cross section of the optic nerve head. Inside here, we have the retinal ganglion cells with their axons, which are, which from the, um, which exit the optic nerve head and goes intracranially. Posteriorly here, we have the boundary of the laminar crevosa, And on the anterior portion, we have the optic disc which contains the ring consisting of nearer tissue and the central cup, which is slightly paler than the ring. In the center of it, in the center of it, we have the central retinal artery and the vein. Okay. We are with you. Yes, sir. sorry. Before we go into the pathologic aspects, it would, it would be good to know what a normal disc like so that that will aid in identification of pathologic processes. Just like we have individual variations, the normal disc exhibits a wide variation. The images you're seeing on the screen presently are normal variants of the optic disc. What do they have in common? They have they all have the central retinal artery and veins. They have a new retinal ring which is held in obeying the isn't true. Some have some temporal disc form, and some have a large optic disc, and some have a small optic disc. In evaluation of the optic nerve head, remember that the anterior aspect of the optic nerve head can be seen ophthalmoscopically, and the standard way of examination is the use of the slit lamp bow microscope, as this affords um, stereoscopy and depth perception. It is good for the pupil to be dilated to, for better clarity and contrast. While using the slit lamp bow microscope and in estimation of the optic disc, the slit lamp bow microscope is used in conjunction with the magnifying fundus lenses. When you normally in our environment here, we have the 78D fundus lens and the 90D fundus lenses. The, the measurements on the graticle of the slit lamp bow microscope has to be multiplied by a correcting factor depending on the type of the lens used. For the 78D, we, the correcting factor is a multiplication of 1.1, while for the 90D, the correcting factor is 1.6 that will be used to multiply to get the estimate, to get the size of the optic disc. Generally speaking, the direct, direct ophthalmoscope is not encouraged for use because of its molecular view, but in certain instances where you have a more open patient, you may use the direct ophthalmoscope. Following your examination of the disc findings, it is good to document your findings, either drain or better still, a disc photography. In evaluating the optic nerve, the first of the, one of the first things we need to do is to identify the boundary of the disc. This we can do via three options. One is the color change, which is said to be about 80% accurate, use of the sterile leaf, and then the change in the reflection of the vessel. When we talk about the change in the color, in changing color to identify the boundaries of the optic disc, here on this image, 
we have an arrow showing the, clearly the boundaries of the optic disc. Between the rim, this is the neuroretinary and the retinal layer, there's a sharp change in color. The, the border of the change in color is what serves as a boundary of the optic disc. And then the sterile leaf is a white, whitish, is a whitish ring, which, set, which uh, conforms with the boundary of the choriosphere canal through which the optic nerve exits the eyeball. The, bound, the sterile leaf also serves as a boundary of the optic disc, and it can be used to, to make an um, estimation of the size of the disc. Another method of identification of the boundary of the optic disc is the inner aspect of the peri peripapillary uh, area. We're soon going to be talking about the peripapillary area. The image on your left here shows an optic nerve head with, a, with an area of peripapillary area. And on the right, it's been the inner aspect of the peripapillary area has been clearly marked as the boundary of the disc. If you look, look closely as well, you will notice that there's still some remnants of the peripapillary area outside of this line, showing that it's the inner aspect of the peripapillary area that serves as a boundary of the optic disc. We talk, also, to, um, another way of estimating the boundary of the disc is the reflection from the blood vessel. Generally, the walls of the vessels are transparent. So during ophthalmoscopy, when light is shown, there's a reflection from the blood column within the vessels. However, if you observe closely, looking at this long arrow here, there's a change in reflection. The reflection from this blood vessel, it's more obvious than the one within the vessel. There's a sharp change, there's a little change, it's a, it's a bit subtle. There's a change in the reflection. And this change, at the point of this change is where we mark the boundary of the optic disc. Likewise, I did think the reflection from the vessels here, it's more obvious than within the disc here, which, where it appears to have disappeared. So at the points where you have a change in reflection from the blood vessel, which marks a change in direction of the vessel is a boundary for the optic disc. Having estimated the boundaries of the optic disc, we need to estimate the size of the disc. Like I mentioned, the, the slit lumbar microscope using the vertical, using the slit beam, and with the use of high, um, with the use of fundus lenses, which are high powered. On the average, the disc is about one to 1.5 to 2 millimeters, with an average vertical dimension of 1.8 millimeters, and an horizontal direction um, dimension of 1.7 millimeters. The images you're seeing presently are average uh, disc sizes of uh, varying disc sizes. The one on the left that is a big large disc. The one on the middle is an average size disc, while the one to the right is a relatively non relatively small disc size. The uh, the estim the appropriate measurements will be taken with the slit lamp uh, microscope. Another area of importance when evaluating the optic nerve area optic nerve area for glaucoma is assessing of assessment of the peripapillary area. The peripapillary area is an area of hyper and hyperpigmentation surrounding the optic disc. It is usually common temporarily, however, it may encircle the whole optic disc. And generally, it has two zones the outer buffer zone and the inner detail zone. most likely to be in the area of the maximal neuroretinal loss. And also, peripapillary atrophy is said to increase with worsening of glaucomatous neuroretinal loss. The, this, the image on the left shows an, shows an, an obvious glaucomatous neuropathy with a wide range of neuro, uh, with a wide range of peripapillary atrophy. And here on the right, we're able to identify the outer alpha zone and the inner beta zone which the inner beta which is more specific for glaucoma. We now come to evaluation of the cup disc ratio, another important feature in assessment of the optic nerve head for glaucoma in, in relation to glaucoma. It's the cup disc ratio is the ratio of the cup with respect to the disc. Because the optic nerve head generally have a wide variation, so we expect that the, the cup disc ratio to, will exhibit a wide variation in values. It is important to have an accurate vision of the optic disc 
the optic curve or of the optic curve to get an accurate cup dispersion. This image shows the right where we view. This is the image we used, the color change to identify the boundary of the disk. Similarly, a color change can be seen here between the new retinal ring and the edge of the cup. This serves as a, as a demarcation for the optic cup as well. But in addition, the area where vessels kink is a, is a bit more accurate when you are assessing the boundaries of the cup. You need an estimation of the boundary of the cup and the boundary of this to do um, to get your estimation of the cup disc ratio. The normal cup disc ratio ranges from 0.1 to 0.4, although it may extend the physiologic balance to 0.6. When you have a cup disc ratio that is equal to or greater than 0.8, it should be considered as a sign, sign of glaucomatous optic neuropathy until proven otherwise. In instances where you have the vertical elongation of the cup, this may be as a result of progression where you have damaged the halfway fibers that enter the optic nerve superiorly and inferiorly. It's important to note that there are two principal limitations of the cup disc ratio. One does not account for the disc size. And the second is that there is a focal narrowing. When there is in the presence of a focal narrowing of the neurotomy. <laughs> tries to demonstrate the limitation of the cup discretion in assessing chromatous neuropathy. The image on the left, we have a, a relatively oval disc with a healthy neurotomy. And if we do a cup ratio here, we'll give you roughly about 0.3. On the left here, we have uh, is a vertically oval disc with a cup disc ratio about 0.3, but it's obvious that there's focal thinning of the new retina in here. And this shows that this is an unheld, even though they have the same cup. I'm not sure if others can hear the audio. So, I'm not hearing you. No. Okay, Dr. Daramosu. Dr. Daramosu, we are having problems with your audio. We have lost your audio. But obviously, the focal loss of new retinary, the focal loss of new retinary, which is not healthy. Yes, it still gives us a cup description of 0.3. These limitations mentioned with regard to the cup disc ratio brings about what we call the ring disc ratio. The ring ratio is the relationship where the data of the new retina ring is corrected for the diameter of the disc. Now, as we earlier mentioned, we're going to use this schematic image to describe the ring disc ratio. Having identified the boundaries of the optic disc, Clearly identified in the schematic image. You also note your boundaries of the optic core, clearly identified here. Then we have in we're taking this meridian, the diameter of the disk in this meridian is 1.0, and therefore the, the radius of the meridian is 0.3. When you look at the ring and compare it with the curve, there is more new um new there is more space in the the 0 0.5, the neural, the neural tissue takes up more of the uh, regions, and that's why you have a ring distribution along this meridian of 0 0.3. We have a fundus, imagery, uh, fundus photography here showing an optic uh, nerve here. Yes, the optic bodies have been identified, and then the optic disc, also, sorry, the optic cuff is identified using where this vessel appears to be tinted. If you take a looking at the radius in this meridian, expanding to the center of the cup, 
you now take a ring disc ratio. The ring disc ratio in this optic disc is 0 0.2. With the use of the ring disc ratio, brings about the disc damage likelihood scale. The disc light damage likelihood scale is based on the radial width of the neuroretinal ring when it's measured at the narrowest point. As a unit of measurement is the ring to this ratio. The disc damage likelihood scale also assesses the circumferential length when a ring is absent. When there is no ring remaining, the ring to this ratio is set to be zero. The DPLS helps us to quantify change on the optic disc length. Um, on the optic disc, and this can be used to detect protection. It also takes into consideration the size of the disc. This table here gives us the DDLS scale, and it is aimed at the average optic disc size of 1.2 to 0. We have a staging of 1 to 10. And we have schematic images of the optic nerve care, nerve care. Let's say, for example, in stage four, we have a new retinal ring. You take the, you take the you take your measurement at the place where the new retinal ring is the thinnest and compare it with the radius of the curve. If you get a value of 0 0.1 to 0 0.9, it is given a DDLS stage of four, in which case it is prepared to be at rest. When there's massive staining, such as we have here, the ring to this ratio is 0.1 and the obvious locomotive damage. In the case of an, uh, a complete, a focal loss of nearest ring, the ring to this ratio is zero. And then we now start estimating the extent in terms of degree. For each degree, so depending on how many clock hours you have the absence of a neural tissue, you are able to know what grade to give it. If you have a, a clock hours extending to 91 to 180 degrees, you have a DDLS scale of A, which is obvious locomotor disability. This, has, um, this DDLS has factored in the size of the disc, such that this, is a, this, is, this table is for use when you have an average size. And in the presence of a small disc, you add one, one digit to the scale you get Using, using the rim disc ratio. And if it's an, um, a large disc, you will subtract one digit from the scale you get, having taken your rim disc ratio. Let's try and compare the, compare, um, the objectivity of using the cup disc ratio or the rim disc ratio. The image on the left, labeled A, is an optic nerve head slightly over. If you take a cup disc ratio, this gives you about 0.5 cup disc ratio. The image labeled B is slightly larger than the one on the right and has a slightly larger optic disc curve. Likewise, you get the cup disc ratio of 0.5. When you come to the image C, we're talking about a ring to this ratio. We're taking it in the horizontal meridian here, almost horizontal meridian, because this is the thin expression of the optic ring. And when you do a ring to this ratio here, you get a ring this ratio of about 0.2. If when we check our scale, it gives us that the disc is at risk with, with a DDLS of, of 3. However, you still come to the same disc, which was reported as a cut this ratio of 0 0.5 here. Okay? You take the ring to this ratio at the narrow point here, the ring to this ratio, which is virtually less than 0.5. The cup discretion would have been given as 0 0.5. However, you have a ring discretion given as less than 0 0.1. And this gives us an obvious locomotor damage. So this helps to explain the limitation we have when we, we stay strictly with the use of the cup discretion rather than this ring discretion. We also need to talk about the new retinal ring, which is the area of tissue between the optic cup and the optic cup. We talked about identifying the optical and, and, and identifying the bottles of the optical. You assess the nearest scenario for generalized pain or notching. And then in a regular size disc, with, in a regular shaped disc and, and, and of regular size, you apply the easing shoe, which refers to the thickness of the nearest scenario, said to be thicker, superiorly, followed by superior nasal and temporal. When you have violations of the easing shoe, it's about the concern of a possible focus of 
you to drop off. Localized loss of experience in the area, that is notching, most typically occurs in the inferior and superior temporal holes, holes where you have apex um, entering the optic disc. These areas are known to be susceptible to glaucomatous damage, and then when you have localized loss, it's possible that any case of glaucomatous we also need to talk about the retinal nerve fiber layer. In a normal healthy eye, the retinal nerve fiber layer is seen as fine and bright striations that are radiating out to the head. When in the presence of defects, there's loss of this normal striation and it tends to appear as darker zones in areas where you expect to find brightness of retinal, uh, of LG retinal nerve fiber layer um, striation. The best way in which to exert retinal nerve fiber layer is with the use of the red free light. With the use of the red free light, the green light is absorbed by the choreocular capillaries and the retinal epithelium, and it gives a good background for examination of the retinal nerve fiber layer. The RSL, they, 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 they occur commonly when damage to the superior and inferior average bundles, although it, it occurs more in period. And RNL defects are said to be about 80 to 10 percent of the cover, and they generally precede locomotor disc changes and visual field loss. Focal RNL defect is usually associated with notch of the or with a recurrent of prior optical hemorrhage, developed about two weeks. This black and white image polished show. A wet, white fine striation, bright radiations of healthy RNA cell, and the dark area where you have it. RNA cell defect in the image here too shows. And are in them, you have areas of fine white spray. We seem to have lost the end of that recording. Um, well, nevertheless, I hope it will be available on, on online at uh, YouTube. Host, can we have the end of the recording? Or do we go next to the second presenter? It was almost done, though. Just about five more minutes. Let's continue, please. Okay, two more minutes. Of the new retina ring, or where a RNA nerve, RNA nerve defect was previously observed. Optic disc imagery too can precede notching of the ring, or it can precede the localized RNA nerve defect. When you have optic nerve, optic disc imagery at the bottom of the disc, it is highly pathogenic for fine. It is a highly pathognomonic finding for glaucomatous neuropathy, especially the normal tension there. It highly manifests glaucoma trial and the collaborative normal tension glaucoma trial. We have just demonstrated that it, uh, the presence of optic nerve head was strongly associated with progression of damage. Here we have an optic disc hemorrhage right at the edge of the disc. And in association with an RNA left defect. This is an obviously glaucomatous complication. There are other non specific signs of glaucomatous neuropathy, which include bilateral aggression. By next month, previously, where you have some loss of neural tissue, where you have in which uh, sarcomenia vessels were previously lying on, and you have a nasalization of the blood vessels in the optic nerve tract. The, uh, the central retina, artery, and brain are usually in the center, but then it's a non specific finding where you have nasalization of the blood vessels in the optic nerve tract. What are the red flags? When do we need, when, we, when do we suspect that it is not glaucoma? When do we need to do a neurological workup? If you have marked asymmetry greater than 0.2, or you have monoocular optic nerve, nerve head involvement stimulating glaucoma, in the presence of unexplained re reduction in the visual acuity, where you have visual loss out of proportion to the optic nerve head, or you have typical neurological symptoms or non or non glaucomatous, and you have the presence of 
optic nerve pair, which is a uh, optic nerve pair panel, which is an excess of the area of coughing. We know glaucoma to be associated with a progressive neuropathy. Typically, coughing, where you have um, and posterior displacement of the spinning and posterior displacement of the laminar compression. In conclusion, optic nerve head evaluation is a skill that should be mastered to avoid mistakes of trauma, especially in the early stages. A single evaluation of the coptic disc, which is not sufficient conservation of an optic disc is a glaucoma. The aim to this ratio is a more objective alternative with storage, shown with disc damage like units. These are my references. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Daramosu. That was an excellent presentation. Well, we're about six minutes behind schedule, so I will invite um, our next speaker to go right ahead with her presentation. I'd like to encourage all our participants to continue to drum those questions up on the chat screen, and we will address those questions um, by and by. So far, I've not seen any questions, though. So our next speaker is starting with a poll. Thank you. Dr. Kana, you have the floor or the air. Good, af okay. Good afternoon, um, seniors and colleagues. Um, it's my pleasure to be here today to give a talk on um, evaluation of the optic nerve head from a neuro-ophthalmology um, standpoint. The goal of this presentation today is to be able to differentiate glaucomatous from a non-glaucomatous optic atrophy. It's not just enough to say this is not glaucoma. If you say it's not glaucoma, then it opens your mind to a whole lot of um, other etiologies of um, non-glaucomatous optic atrophy. So at the end of this um, talk today, we should be able to describe important historical questions in a case of um, um, non-glaucomatous optic um, neuropathy. We should be able to critically examine the optic nerve head and then to tailor our investigations based on our clinical evaluation. So we're going to start with the poll. Yeah, this is the poll. It says, um, which of this optic nerve heads were, um, are most um, likely non-glaucomatous? We have four options, A, B, C, and D. So we'll be expecting your response now. I think we can end the poll now, right? Okay, okay so 47% um, says is one, um, three, and four. So we'd find out at the end of the presentation. You can go ahead. Okay, so this is the second um, poll. It says a 32-year-old obese lady with um, visual acuity of 360 OD, OS 624, right RAPD, and um, above DIX findings. What is the most likely diagnosis? We have four options. So we can go ahead and 
Вот. I think um, we can end. Okay, fine. So here um, we have 70% of participants um, chose the first option, that's um, idiopathic intracranial hypertension. So we'd find out the answer at the end of the presentation. So um, this is the outline for the presentation. So um, I would want to start by actually sharing two stories um, um, as regards misdiagnosis, because a misdiagnosis actually accounts for 20% of um, cases. So it means for every five um, glaucoma patients we see, one of them is likely um, going to be misdiagnosed. So the first um, story I want to share actually happened to a senior colleague who went for the part one exams. He was given a patient who everybody thought was glaucoma, but after 40 minutes of interacting with this patient, he, um, he was able to dig out a, a history of um, galactoria and other endocrine symptoms in the patient. And having um, said that, the uh, examiner was very impressed with him and gave him a 14 in the exam. We all know what 14 means in a long case. Then the second story is um, one I read is about um, a 57 year old um, patient who presented with, uh, key, uh, with right visual loss. He was initially seen um, by the retinal specialist who referred him to a glaucoma specialist. He had um, a copying of the right disc with an apparently normal left disc. He was actually placed on um, latanoprost, but um, the, the visual symptoms um, kept deteriorating. So he was referred to a neuro-ophthalmologist who, um, when he saw him, the patient, okay, I forgot to say he's uh, hypertensive, diabetic, he's overweight, he also has um, sleep apnea. So the first thing the neuro-ophthalmologist did was to stop the um, the, the latanoprost to know what the baseline IOP is. So when he did that, the IOP was 18 on the right and then 17 millimeters of mercury on the left. So he actually um, checked for an APD, which he has on the right. Then he um, requested for a home free visual field, which was really not, not specific. It only showed a central island of vision on the right. So he went further. He I really needed something to hold on to. So he requested for a uh, Goldman perimetry, which is um, which can be used for patients that are not um, very cooperative, which he did. And then it brought out the um, complete um, field loss on the right, and then a superior temporal field loss on, on the left. So he requested for neuroimaging, which showed a uh, uh, junctional scotoma and the um, radiologist immediately called him because it was uh, it was an emergency since there was evidence of a midline shift. So um, I just want us to hold this um, stories in mind as I continue with the presentation. So um, by way of introduction, optic neuropathy actually refers to the damage of the optic nerve um, head, which can occur anywhere along from the retina up to the lateral geniculate body. It's actually a common cause of visual loss. It cuts across all age groups. And because there are varying, um, the, there are quite a number of etiologies and they all have multiple overlapping clinical characteristics. So um, they are, the, uh, the insult to the optic nerve can occur directly or it can occur from ischemia to the optic nerve head. Regardless of the cause, the end, um, the end point of optic neuropathy is optic atrophy. 
Um, for the epidemiology, I left this slide empty on purpose because um, the epidemiology of non-glaucomatous optic neuropathy actually depends on geography. So um, um, we have the sparsity of data regarding um, op non-glaucomatous optic neuropathy here in Nigeria. Most um, There are quite a few studies that were done, which are mostly retrospective studies. And all the studies actually, um, in all the studies, up to 50% of cases uh, where um, the etiology was not um, known. So I think um, it's something we should look into and then consider a, a prospective study to act, a prospective multicenter study to look out for the um, etiologies of non-glaucomatous optic neuropathy in our, our environment, which will help us in in uh, management of this patient. And we could also go further to do um, clinical trials to know what will work for us. Then a brief anatomy, even though my co-presenter talked about it, but I just want to dwell on the blood supply. The optic nerve head actually has four parts. There's a superficial retinal nerve fiber layer, there's a pre-lamina, lamina, and then the retrolamina part. The super superficial nerve fiber layer is supplied by the um, central retinal artery, and then the remaining three layers are supplied by the um, cycle of the inhaler, which is an anastomotic um, cycle that is formed by um, branches from the short posterior ciliary arteries. So uh, an occlusion of the central retinal artery will result in um, optic atro um, atrophy, as well as occlusion of the um, short posterior ciliary arteries, which is seen in ischemic optic neuropathies. And also for um, copying to to, um, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but um, as I said, this is the superficial layer. So this is the optic nerve. For copying to occur, there's usually loss of this, um, the retinal nerve fibers are lost. So if only the retinal fib nerve fibers are lost, the discs will not be copped. It will just be a flat, pale disc. But if the supporting structures, that's the um, glial cells, are, as well as the scleral um, connective tissues are lost, then copying will result. So most of the time we have a uh, copying in glaucoma, but in other um, optic neuropathies, even though they are not so common, but they do exist. So we should know that copying is not patronymonic of glaucoma. Yeah. Um, a lot of causes of non-glaucomatous optic um, neuropathy, which include inflammatory, ischemic, compression, trauma, papillary edema, hereditary causes, toxins, alcohol, antibiotics chlor like chloramphenicol, anti-malaria, we have quinine, chloroquine, and the likes, then anti-TB drugs like metotrexate, uh, sorry, uh, rifampicin, um, isoniazid, anti-cancer like metotrexate, um, heavy metals like lead. Then we also have um, nutritional def um, deficiencies of vitamins, um, vitamins B, folate. Then we have the anomalous optic disc. Then we have miscellaneous, which can cause um, secondary um, spread to the orbit. Then um, for the optic neuritis, um, there's a classification with a whole range of causes ranging from demyelination, infectious causes, post-vaccination, um, inflammatory disorders, and also isolated optic um, neuropathy. So, so what are the steps in evaluating a case of optic neuro, um, neuropathy? As um, with every field in medicine, in um, the bedrock to diagnostic localization in neuroophthalmology is a thorough history and a complete physical examination, without which a uh, investigation is actually of limited utility. So what are the steps here? We have to take a detailed history of symptoms, then we confirm the presence of optic neuropathy. So what are associated um, signs, ocular, systemic, then we try to localize the optic nerve lesion, determine a presumed etiology, and then obtain and, and test to confirm our diagnosis. In conversing with um, a patient, what are we interested in? We're interested in the age because, I, as we said earlier, optic um, neuropathy cuts across all age groups. So it will actually um, uh, give us an idea of what the etiology is. 
the onset of um, symptoms, was it an acute onset or a progressive onset? If it's an acute onset, one would be thinking of um, inflammatory or ischemic causes. Well, for a, a progressive, it could be compression, it could be toxins, it could be nutritional and the likes. Then we are also interested in the pain. Is there any history of pain? Pain will be seen um, commonly in inflammatory as well as ischemic um, um, conditions. So the pain may be actually um, discomfort or is it pain in on eye movements? Then other, um, other points we'll be interested in will include jaw claudication, temporal skull pain, um, new headaches. Uh, was there any tra uh, transient um, visual loss, myalgia? Then we'll also be interested in neurologic symptoms. Since we said um, neurologic um, conditions can actually cause um, optic neuropathy. This will include like weakness, loss of um, paralysis, paresis, and the likes. Then we'll also be interested in endocrine symptoms like um, we mentioned in the first story I narrated, galactoria, infertility, loss of libido. Uh, then there could also be acromegaly depending on um, the type of um, endocrine abnormality present. Then we are also looking, going to look at other systemic symptoms. Since we mentioned a barrage of um, conditions can actually cause um, optic neuropathy. So we can look at the chest. Are we interested? Is there, is there any um, um, pulmonary symptoms? We want to look at a weight loss and a whole lot. Then we'll also talk, look at um, history of trauma, then autos phenomenon, which is seen in um, inflammatory optic neuropathy, which is um, decreased in vision with, um, in, with exercise, which is increased temperature, any hemate sign, which is um, electric sensation over the neck, also seen in demyelinating optic um, neuropathy. Then in children, because we said um, uh, post, um, there's post-vaccination um, optic neuropathy, so we'll be interested in that history. And history of hypertension, diabetes, hypercholesterolemia, drug history, and then family history for hereditary optic neuropathy. Then for examination, we'll be interested in the visual acuity of um, the patients. Um, I, some, the, the visual acuity may actually be normal, may be um, decreased or may be improved because there was a case of a patient who actually presented with an improved visual acuity. He actually is, a, he was a myope of minus two. So he presented with, suddenly he realized he didn't need to wear his glasses to be able to see. So um, he was excited, but um, on, on um, imaging, it was discovered he had an orbital mass, which was actually pushed the globe, creating a hyperopic shift, which explained his improvement in vision. Then we'll also be interested in um, color test. Want to do a color desaturation test and also an, an objective um, color um, assessment such as the Ishihara. It's not um, just enough for us to just, uh, for the patient to be able to identify the characters, but we should also be keen on looking at um, the, the time it takes for the patient, especially in, um, in, in uh, unilateral optic neuropathies. The patient may be able to identify, but it will take him a longer time to um, identify in that particular eye. So we should look out for that. Now we are also interested in the extraocular motility because um, there are a number of conditions that can cause uh, motility disturbances, which include um, thyroid eye disease, which includes also um, intra and multiple sclerosis where you can have intranuclear ophthalmoplegia. So we'll be interested in that. Then we'll also look at um, the anterior segment for any sign of um, inflammation. Since we mentioned the host of inflammatory disorders, infections like toxo, um, Okay, okay, we are also we also want to check the pupils for the um for any relative afferent pupillary defects, which is very important because um it usually occurs in um 
asymmetric um, unilateral cases of optic neuropathy. So in this, uh, we are interested in because uh, most cases of glaucoma are actually bilateral. So um, if you have a relative afferent pupillary defect, it actually points towards um, non-glaucomatous, except there's an explanation, there's a secondary cause of that uni of unilateral glaucoma. Then we're also interested in intraocular pressure and then udo of endoscopy. So, um, So um, in examination, we are looking out um, in fundoscopy specifically, we are looking out um, for the DIGS. My co-presenter has actually mentioned how all the, um, what we'll be looking for on the DIGS, but specifically for non-glaucomatous optic neuropathy, is the DIGS normal or abnormal? Is this condition unilateral or bilateral? The swelling of the DIGS, is this a swelling mild or severe? How, how is the margin? Are, they, are the margins blurred? Are there hemorrhages, cutting wool spots, vascular changes, patents line, or are there reduction in um, vessels on the dig surface or dilation, dilated artery uh, capillaries on the dig surface, which is actually seen in ischemic um, optic neuropathy. Or do we have a, um, uh, the, in late stages, they present with pallor or some uh, optic neuropathies actually presents with pallor without inflammation. So we are looking at the pallor. Is it a total um, temporal, sectoral, or a total? Is there a pallid, chalky, white appearance of the dicks, which is seen in arteritic optic neuropathy? Then we'll also be interested in the neuroretinal rim, the nerve fiber layers, and also the um, peripapillary area. Then we also look out the macula for any um, evidence of um, inflammation because we can see inflammatory um, exudates, the macula star in infectious um, optic neuropathy. Then we will also look at the um, retinal periphery for any obvious cause of that, um, of the optic um, neuropathy. Then it will be also be good to, if, the, if um, there's a dick swelling, one want to rule out, is this um, a dick um, edema or is it a papillary edema? So one, we have to differentiate the two because they are two different entities with varying etiologies. Then um, this is a classification of the optic, optic um, atrophy that's ophthalmoscopic classification into um, primary, secondary, and then uh, the consecutive. In the primary, there's, um, the dix is just pale. This, the, the first one here is the primary. So the dix is pale, the margins are well-defined. So, um, Causes here it will include um, nutritional toxin, um, optic um, neuritis. The typical optic neuritis can give this um, this um, picture. Then um, a secondary, that's the one on my the extreme right. It shows um, edema of the. It shows um, a dix, swollen dicks with blood margins. And then there are reduction of vessels on the dick surface, which is the secondary. And then causes are usually ischemic and atypical optic um, neuritis. Then the central is the consecutive, which results from disease of the inner retina of it or its blood supply. And then the cause of the optic neuropathy is actually obvious on examination. So here we can see the dick's um, pallor with um, attenuation of the arterioles and then the wax, the bone speckle appearance. So then um, these are actually late stages of um, optic neuropathy where we have copping. And as we can see, almost um, all these um, pictures we have here shows um, some degree of copping, which I can tell you they are not glaucoma. So what are the red flags we will be looking at? Even though my co-presenter mentioned them, but I think they are very important and I don't mind going over them again. They include rapid progression of visual loss without, any, without an adequate um, explanation. Then we have visual acuity out of proportion to DIX changes. Then visual field loss progressing despite normal intraocular pressure. When we have a case of unilateral normal pre um, pressure glaucoma, abnormal color vision, relative afferent pupillary defect, and then a pale neuroretinal rim. I just want to quickly share the this assessment project. It was um, 
a study that was done, it cut um, in three continents involving 23 optic nerve experts. They were asked to review, the aim of the study was um, to determine whether optic nerve experts here, yeah, by optic nerve experts, I mean um, glaucoma specialists and then neuro ophthalmologists, if they can distinguish glaucoma um, from autosomal dominant optic atrophy and then the um, lever hereditary optic neuropathy on Dick's assessment alone. So they were given um, 15 pictures of normal, normal eyes glaucoma, then the um, hereditary optic neuropathies. Um, so the results, they actually found that 85% um, they had got the diagnosis correct in 85% of normal, 75% of um, glaucoma, 27% of autosomal dominant um, optic, optic atrophy, and then 16% of um, lever hereditary optic neuropathy. So this, um, we can notice the, the, the um, diagnosis for, for the hereditary optic neuropathy, the percentage is actually lower. They were actually misdiagnosed as glaucoma. So in conclusion, they, they concluded that Dick's assessment alone is not enough to make a diagnosis. One has to look out other parameters, the history, and then ancillary investigations as well. What are the ancillary tests we want to do? They include visual field, uh, OCT neuroimaging blood test, and then um, temporal artery biopsy and um, Lumbar puncture. So um, visual field is actually non-specific because it can give a non-specific picture of um, that is actually not specific to a particular condition. But common um, vig, um, fields that are actually pointers to non-ophthalmic, um, non-glaucomatous optic neuropathy would include this: um, a central scotoma. We can have a sicocentral scotoma seen in nutritional or toxic um, optic neuropathies, and we can have uh, altitudinal. We can have enlargement of the blind spots in um, papillary edema. Then we have by temporal hemianopia, sc uh, junctional scotoma, and then uh, homonymous hemianopia. Then for the um, OCT, they're actually very important in. In, in assessment of a patient with neuro uh, with optic neuropathy in that they provide objective measure of the retinal nerve fiber layer as well as the, the ganglion cell complex. It's actually very important in monitoring papillary edema. It can differentiate between um, compressive optic neuropathy from glaucoma in that the loss of the ganglion cell complex will actually respect the vertical midline like in the, in the report I have of the one at the bottom here. We can see that there's thin in here. Uh, the, um, the nasal fibers are thin, which um, is saying there's a chiasmal lesion. Then it can actually be used to monitor, um, to, to is, a, is the best predictor actually for visual outcome after surgery for patients with um, compressive optic neuropathy. Then it can be used to monitor patients on fingolimod, which is a drug used for treating multiple sclerosis. It causes um, macular edema, so one can use that. Then it can be used to detect subtle optic neuropathy as well as to differentiate early um, lever hereditary optic neuropathy from a functional visual loss. So what are the indications for neuroimaging in optic neuropathy? Um, indications include vertically aligned field defects, pale, neuroretinal rim, the presence of um, hypopituitary dysfunction, associated neurologic abnormalities, and then demyelinating um, optic neuropathies. These are actually images from different conditions. Here we have um, demyelinating optic neuropathy with enhancement of the optic nerve. Then we have a case of optic, uh, of optic nerve sheet uh, meningioma, optic glioma, and then um, thyroid eye disease. So the, the blood test actually depends on the findings on, on, on um, clinical evaluation. So want to do specifically a complete blood count, ESR, um, C-reactive protein in um, where we are suspecting a, a atheritic um, ischemic optic neuropathy. Complete blood count is actually important also in um, infectious causes of uh, optic neuropathy. So other investigations we want to do, we want to rule out TB, HIV, toxo, syphilis, batonella antibodies, which are important um, infectious causes of um, optic um, neuropathy. Then we can also do aquaporin um, for antibiotics for, for 
neuromyelitis optica, MOG antibodies, ACE for sarcoidosis, ANA anchor for anti autoimmune diseases, vitamin B12 folate for nutritional um, deficiency, then genetic testing for hereditary optic um, neuropathies. And CSF analysis, we're interested in because um, bacterial um, meningitis is an important cause infectious cause of optics, so we want to do that. And we're also interested in that because of um, papilloedema, if we are suspecting um, a case of idiopathic intracranial hypertension, we'll be interested in the opening pressure, the CSF com um, composition, and then oligoclonal bands for multiple um, sclerosis. What's the take home message here? Um, copying should, is not patonymonic of glaucoma. We should consider non glaucomatous optic neuropathy in all glaucoma cases. We should look out for red flags. And then Hickam's um, dictum is very, very much applicable, which states that um, a patient can have as many diagnoses as he very well pleases. So it means that a patient with primary open, uh, open angle glaucoma does not mean he cannot ha um, have an intracranial tumor. So we should always be on the lookout. Then optic atrophy is actually not a diagnosis. It's just a clinical um, finding. Then we should consider optic neuropathy related researches and also population or findings. Then when in doubt, ask a second opinion. So we're going to take the poll again after, the, um, after this um, presentation. So um, is that they are the same questions we had um, at the beginning. So we have a 32-year-old obese patient with um, visual IQT, OD 360, OS 624, right um, RAPD and the above DIX findings. What is the most likely diagnosis? I can't come out. Just wait, wait. It's coming out in one hour. Okay. So I think we can end the poll, poll now. Okay, so here actually the, um, the correct um, answer is bilateral optic neuro neuritis because in idiopathic intracranial hypertension, which is a cause of papillary edema, the visual loss will not be poor. The, I just gave the obese lady as a catch. So usually in the first early stages of papillary edema, the vision, vision is preserved. So the, um, it's not pituitary adenoma. It's not um, non-arteritic ischemic optic neuropathy because of the age. So I, it's not pituitary adenoma because it's very unlikely for it to cause um, papillary edema. For you to have papillary edema, you, should, you would expect a large um, tumor, which will cause a raised um, intracranial pressure, which pituitary adenoma is possible, but it is not very common. Then for the second um, poll, So which of these optic nerve heads are most likely neuroophthalmic? We have one, two, three, and four. The poll is on, and we're expecting some votes. Thank you. So um, C, D. So yeah, this um, this is the right answer actually. A one, three, and four are likely um neuroophthalmic, because um as we can see here the 
neural retinal rim, which is an important pointer in determining, in differentiating glaucoma from a non-glaucomatous um, optic neuropathy is pale in all of this tree. While in the second one, it's um, pink. Yeah, so we are going to the reward question now. So it's um, the best, um, the winner will actually get a 5,000 gift, Naira gift card. So uh, this is the question. So the first person to answer, it should be in the chat box, please. The 30. So we just have um, one minute for this. And then we can. Well, can we go ahead? Can I? It seems to be past time. Sorry. I think you should just give about two more minutes because we have only about three or four responses so far. Okay. But it seems uh, in, nobody has written the responses as one, two, three, four, five. People are giving individual responses. So um, participants, there are five questions in one. So I think you should just number your responses. Number one, this is just one answer question for each. Number two, this. Number three, please read the question and just label your responses. One, two, three, four, five. You need to put five responses. Thank you. It's 1,000 now, correct response. Yeah. <laughs> 
I will give 30 seconds more. To allow for anybody to correct their responses. Everybody is just giving individual responses. You need to give five. One, two, just write everything in one sentence. Number one is this. Number two is this. Number three is this. Number four is this. Number five is this. Otherwise, we will not have a clear winner. So far, we have only one person who has uh, given a correct sequence of responses. I think some people are having difficulty typing, so some people have requested a little bit more time. So we we'll give, let's see what time this is. We'll give uh, two more minutes to allow for anybody whose secretary is not in the office to type by themselves. <laughs> Dr. Atta, I can see one, one response and another response for number five. We might have to tear the gift card if we have single responses by individuals. Mm -hmm. So far, two people have given the full complement of uh, responses. Just label one, two, three, four, five in one sentence. All right. I'm going to start counting down. We have 15 seconds more. 10 seconds. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. Six, seven, eight, nine. Okay. Okay. People are still responding. I will wait one minute. And on the dot of one hour, 14 minutes, I will stop the clock. So we have uh, about 45 seconds. 40 seconds. Good. 30 seconds more. I'm looking at the clock here. We have 15 seconds more. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, so um, that's the end, host. Okay. So I've stopped the clock at uh, Bolaji Adiola's response. Okay. So if you can project, uh, I'm going to have to oh. go now to just document the responses. Okay.
So can I share the answers now? Yeah, so um, you can. Just to, just to let participants know that we have the chat in front of us and so it is easy to know who has, who is the first to get all the questions right. I'm going to just uh, document people's responses, starting from the first five correct responses. We're not gonna take any of the individual uh, single, single um, responses. It's only those who are putting five responses. Thank you. And these are the correct answers. Number one is the patient has a right optic neuropathy. Two, the reason being right severe retinal disease, despite the fact that this was a neuroophthalmology talk. But again, it was a red herring. The problem is likely in the left optic tract, patient would present with the right homonymous hemianopia and the lesion is most likely at the brachium of the superior colliculus or in the protector nucleus. So let us see who has come closest to this out of all those who gave five responses. So um, good. Dr. Bernadette Agahan gave ischemic or compressive. Uh, all right. Unfortunately, these are all Okay, yeah. Ischemic or compressive um, disease for one and two. But she says that the lesion for number three is at the chiasm. The lesion is likely um, in the tract. And so therefore number four is wrong by temporal hemianopia. It's supposed to be an RHH and um, the lesion is not at the optic nerve head but it's actually in the brain. So Dr. Bernadette gets two out of five. Dr. Yeyeagba says uh, optic neuritis. Um, well, optic neuropathy, it falls under an optic neuropathy. But uh, number two is saying pituitary adenoma. So that is wrong. Number three also is pointing to chiasm, while in actual fact. Well, the, um, she talks about von Willebrand's knee which um, would be a reflection back into the um, nerve, really, uh, more into the, uh, rather into the tract. So uh, she says a junctional scotoma, uh, that's going to be difficult to accept. Uh, optic nerve again. So that's one correct out of uh, five. The next person, Dr. Adiola says, Optic neuritis, ischemia, um, chiasma lesion by temporal hemianopia. So again, one correct. Dr. Atta, where are one, two, three, and four? I can see number five is saying anterior chiasma lesion. Mm. It's more like a posterior going into the tract. Then uh, Dr. Yeagwa. So I think, okay, well, Dr. Dr. Atta, you have one correct. I can't see two, three, and four. You have one and number five. Dr. Adebowale says right optic neuritis is an optic neuropathy. I will give you that. Uh, okay, an ischemic optic neuropathy. Hmm. Well, no, the, the um, correct answer there is severe retinal disease. Three, again, you said chiasmal lesion. Three here is a more like an optic tract, so in the posterior visual pathway. So one correct. Dr. Abiola, uh, Dr. Popola says optic neuritis, optic atrophy, post, yes, it's retrochiasma, very good. So, so far, Dr. Popola has um, optic neuropathy, one. Uh, I'm assuming you mean consecutive optic um, atrophy, but I will not count that. But three, you are right, it's retrochiasma. For the patient has a homonymous hemianopia, so you get three out of five. Uh, Dr. Ajige said compressive, optic neuritis, compressive, uh, bitemporal, so that's uh, zero there. Dr. Tafika Ademola says compressive, 
ischemic optic neuritis, chiasm, optic nerve. Sorry, again, that would be uh, zero, non correct. And I said I was ending at uh, Dr. Adiola. So we have Dr. Ajige, optic chiasm and tract. Uh, Dr. Ajige, well, we will give you one, Dr. Ajige, because of the tract, but you can't say chiasm and tract. When you say that, uh, that's not uh, quite correct because they are talking more of something like a junction out there uh, posteriorly. So, um, Rukayat, Musibal says ischemic optic neuritis, uh, optic neuropathy, optic neuritis, chiasmal lesion, bitemporal, optic nerve head. Uh, sorry, that's zero. And then Dr. Adiola says optic neuritis, ischemic optic neuritis, chiasmal lesion, bitemporal optic nerve, zero. So the person who gets the most is Dr. Um, Pokwala. This has Dr. Kudira Pokwala, who has three correct out of five. Um, I hope the results are acceptable to everybody. That was a, a, an A4 voting, free and fair electoral process. And we all agree that um, she comes first. Uh, second was two correct answers by Dr. I think Yeye Agba. And then everybody else is tied with either one or zero. Thank you very much. So the, risk, the winner of the gift question is Dr. Kudirat Popola. Thank you very much. Um, so to round up, let me um, address the questions. There was one question by Dr. Kiari, and that goes to Dr. Uh, Kana. It says here, I hope, I'm, I hope everybody is still with us. I can yeah. see we have 64 participants, okay. She says, when you were talking about the optic disc assessment project, um, what was the role of artificial intelligence in determining the um, outcomes or expected outcomes. So in determining neuroophthalmic optic neuropathies, is there a role for artificial intelligence and was it used in the optic disc assessment project? So did they use computer algorithms to uh, look at the optic nerve head and assess the accuracy of people's diagnosis? That goes to you, Dr. Kana. And the other one uh, was from Dr. Ajige to Dr. Daramosu. And it was um, a request for her to differentiate between optic disc edema and papilledema. Thank you very much for those who asked questions. Thank you very much for all the participants that braved the very stormy waters to attempt the responses to Dr. Kana's really, really specially designed and extremely difficult questions just <laughs> to make sure that everybody was listening closely to her lecture. So um, we will have those two questions and then Dr. Sadiq Abdullah has his hand raised. Uh, we will address that after. Thank you very much everybody for your patience. Over to you, Dr. Kana. Answer Dr. Kiari's yeah. question and then after that, Dr. Daramosu. thank you. Okay, with um, regards to artificial intelligence, there was a study that was done to actually um, compare that with um, um, experts examining um, the optic, just similar to the, um, the Dix um, assessment project, but there was an artificial intelligence component incorporated in it. it um, they discovered there was actually no difference between um, the computer and um, evaluating the optic nerve head and the, the um, the the optic nerve experts doing that so um it still goes down to the um the point i made that um without a thorough history just examining um the optic nerve head would really not um is not enough to make a diagnosis 
So um, I just want to quickly come in um, as regards the quiz. I noticed um, most of the participants were talking about chiasmal lesions. The catch in this quiz is um, the contralateral RAPD. A chiasmal lesion will not have an RAPD because both um, nasal fibers are involved. Usually they are symmetrically involved. So you will likely not have an RAPD in a chiasmal lesion. So causes of um, contralateral RAPD are usually um, optic tract lesion, um, lesion of the brachium of the superior colliculus and then the pre, uh, pre lateral nucleus. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Okay, very good. Um, and that goes down to say that in neuroophthalmology, you must read your questions very carefully. Patients often throw us curved balls and we should be prepared for that. Thank you very much, Dr. Daramusu. Are you still online? Can you take Dr. Ajige's question? Yes, please. He says, what is the difference between disc edema and papilledema? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the question. It's been an interesting um, presentation all the while. Generally, we talk about papilledema, referring to the lateral optic disc edema, secondly to a raised intracranial pressure. So because it's a, it's a, a raised intracranial pressure, the back pressure tends to present with bilateral disc edema. But in the case of optic disc edema, it refers to a swelling of the optic nerve head and tends to be, uh, it's usually unilateral. It could be also due to intrinsic ocular factors to that particular optic nerve, such as optic neuritis and or chronic neuritis. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Daramosu, can I throw you a curveball there? Is there any situation where, in actual fact, disc edema is unilateral, but it is due to, due to raised intracranial pressure? Under what circumstances can you have, um, you know, raised intracranial pressure causing swelling of one disc and not the other? Uh, that can occur in a setting of what we call Foster Kennedy syndrome, where we've had a previous optic atrophy that would uh, not allow uh, the presence of an intracranial pressure to cause an optic disc edema. Thank you very much. I hope all the residents and trainees are listening. There is a situation in which case the second disc is physically encumbered from swelling, in which case it has already undergone primary optic atrophy from compression, direct compression on it, and therefore there are no nerve fibers to swell. And so in that case, when you have raised intracranial pressure, then it is only the healthy disc that has sufficient nerve fibers to swell that will swell. Thank you very much. Uh, let's quickly run through we don't have any more questions. Um, we will go to Dr. Abdullahi, who had his hand up. Dr. Sadiq Abdullahi, you had your hand up. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. All right. Um, thank you very much, um, Dr. Kana. This is quite an um, interesting presentation. And I remember during my glaucoma fellowship, I had a rotation in neuroophthalmology. Um, many of the cases that will have otherwise make a diagnosis of glaucoma actually uh, turn out to be um, some neurological condition. Now, recently I, have a, I had a patient. The, my heart, the, the patient had optic atrophy, but he at the same time has angle closure. So I did laser PI, and then coincidentally the pressure wasn't very high. You know, so I was like, what's actually responsible for the glaucomatous abrupt of the optic atrophy? Certainly not typical of glaucoma, but he has angle closure and then optic atrophy. And you see, in, in one of our biggest challenges here is we always make diagnosis of, of optic atrophy without knowing actually what caused the, 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 the optic atrophy. And the patient was referred to us for combined cataract and glaucoma surgeries. But when I look at the eye, it's not, optic nerve evaluation is not typically glaucomatous, but he has um, optic atrophy. 
And then visual field change is also not typical of glaucoma, but he has angle closure and optic atrophy. So in that kind of situation, I would like to know your opinion from neurological sides of this thing. And then secondly, also, there was a patient that we operated. He had fecal trough, vision good initially. And then the vision started to deteriorate. We did all the investigations we could and we couldn't find out. Then we now say, okay, let's do brain CT. And when we do CT, we actually, so that the man has some um, intracranial mass. He has already been, um, I think he, has, he was referred to Vitorate, um, neurosurgeons and he had surgery. So actually, um, neurological evaluation, um, there are so many cases that we can miss as glaucoma, but they're actually not. So Dr. Kano, what's your take on this? This man has angle closure, pressure not very right, like primary angle closure suspect, and has some features of um, optic atrophy. Sorry, and finally, finally, patients that have RP. Patients that have RP, they have optic atrophy, and they also have chances of developing glaucoma. So differentiating optic atrophy from glaucoma in a patient, in, in somebody that has RP and has signs of glaucoma, you know, when you have them mixed together, it's actually become quite um, difficult and, and, and challenging. So I don't know, from the neurological evaluation sites, what can you say about that? Thank you. Um, okay. okay, with regards to, to your first question, um, I think uh, we don't have so much information from the history to make a diagnosis. We should start from there. We actually need to make a um, thorough history. Just um, like um, we want to rule out compression, are there features of um, raised um, intracranial pressure? How old is this patient? So it gives us an idea of um, what type of... Um, optic neuropathy is common in this, um, in that sort of patient. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely, so, um, it's normal, <laughs> no findings. Okay, so so what, how old is this patient? Maybe like 65, maybe we discuss it by the way, I will we'll give you details through your emails. Okay, okay, mm -hmm. because we really um, need to walk up the patient. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Even though okay. Um, okay. Please continue, Dr. Kana. Okay, uh, I was going to say um I know uh, in our setting um we most of our patients cannot afford um investigations, but usually from history and examination we can have an idea of what um the likely etiology is. But really, really we need um those investigations to make a diagnosis. We need them, they are very, very important because if we're saying a patient has um, features of um, compressive optic neuropathy, at what level is this compression? We can just, yeah, we can have an idea, but we can't say for sure what it is. So we can't rule out the um, importance of investigations uh, in evaluating our patients. Thank you very much, Dr. Kana. There's another question here for you from um, Chimezie Obimbam. Now he says, what's the role of OCT uh, in the event that there's a patient with a suspected optic neuropathy, but visual field appears normal? Now he has not specified whether it's a confrontation field or, um, or CVF, either um, central 24 degrees or 30 degrees, but we do know that sometimes patients do have some evidence of optic neuropathy. Okay, it says CVF. Um, and you, you know, you feel that the visual field is not giving you sufficient direction. So what is the role of OCT? Going back okay, to um, your this lecture where you listed some nice... Uh, um, yeah, um, but usually um, for us to win, really need to correlate our findings, history, examination, visual field, and OCT. Because um, you need, yeah, you need OCT is actually going to give you an idea. It will give you an objective um, measure of the um, retinal nerve fiber as well as the ganglion cell um, complex. But I am really um, surprised for you to have a normal um visual field, and then the patient has um, optic neuropathy. Was that a visual field reliable? 
And what's the vision of that patient in the first place? That's, so Dr. Chimezie, the lesson here that um, is being passed across is just that, you know, clinical assessment is very important in determining the selection of tests and the decision you will make upon receipt of the results of those tests. So if you have clinical evidence of anoptic neuropathy, at that point, even before you send the patient for tests, you must have some level of the localization, as well as from your history to have an idea of the potential etiology. Um, indeed, central visual fields cannot be completely relied upon entirely on its own, because in fact, you will find some patients that do not have any sign of optic neuropathy, and they may bring to you what looks like an abnormal central visual field. And I will give you, for instance, an example of a patient I myself saw in the clinic who came with um, bilateral, uh, what looked like bilateral hemi, um, temp temporal hemianopias, you know, and um, she didn't have any features suggestive of um, a pituitary lesion. She also did not have any vision loss. She didn't have any signs of compression. And after evaluating her, the pupils were brisk. They were her vision was fantastic. I sent her back to repeat the fields and she came back with absolutely normal fields. And then I asked her, so what happened? It was a communication problem. She said, oh, they told me that it's only when the, um, the indication lights are within this central area that I should respond. And so she was ignoring when the lights were in the temporal fields. We also have patients that come who have ptosis and they will come with what looks like bilateral or if it's asymmetric, a unilateral altitudinal field loss. So. Normal fields, um, abnormal fields should never be taken in isolation. Thank you very much for that. Um, it seems we don't have any more questions. Uh, I think therefore I would hand over to the host to invite the president of the YOF for his um, address. But before that, I would like to say a big thank you to all our participants who have been patient and to our erudite lecturers this afternoon, Dr. Hashia Kana and Dr. Uh, da Daramosu. I'm trying to get your first name here now. Um, I apologize. Yes, Dr. Habiba Daramosu. Thank you very much for your very enlightening lectures, uh, especially from the glaucoma perspective, telling us about how we should now take note of the rim to disc ratio rather than just your cup to disc ratio and use the DDLS for an assessment of the risk of damage to the disc rather than just waiting until the patient presents the severe damage on CVF. Thank you very much. As the president you. of YOF. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Ma. Uh, I want to thank you very much for agreeing to moderate today's session, and you brought to bear your wealth of, of experience in neuro-ophthalmology. I would also want to thank our, our panelists, Dr. Habibat and Dr. Haisha Kana. Um, the, the notice was a little bit short, but they were able to squeeze us into their schedule, and they came with all guns blazing especially Dr. Kana's <laughs> gift card question. I was very happy I was not allowed to participate so that uh, the breeze will not blow. <laughs> so thank you very much for joining us. And um, we hope that you join us again when we call for your help. Um, I want to thank our academic committee led by Dr. Suyagba and Dr. Mustafa. I want to thank you for the work you're doing. Uh, YOF owes you a great debt of gratitude. Uh, thank you for your patience, everyone. I think we've taken enough of your time. But just before I go, two things I, two things I need to let us know. You can request for your CME points from the website. 
I am, the links will be, the link will be dropped on uh, various social media groups. So request for your links directly there. Your CME um, certificate will be sent to you faster that way with less encumbrance. And then on the 14th of July, the Young Ophthalmologist Forum in conjunction with the Ophthalmologist of Nigeria will be presenting a cornea donation and eye bank awareness program, um, which we, we, we intend to try to drive awareness on cornea donation and the eye banking situation in Nigeria. We'll be having the MD of the Nigeria Eye Bank talking to us. We'll also be having the president of the OSN, Dr. Bade Budipe, and um, other anterior segment and cornea especially discussing with us. It's going to happen on the 14th of July on Wednesday by 4 p.m. We want to ask that we all come again and let's start deciding to carry cards to donate our corneas when we leave mother earth. I know most of us don't have cornea card, we don't have donor cards. Please let's get our donor cards. We're ophthalmologists, let's leave by example. So thank you very much again. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, I think at this point, we'll let you go till, till 14th of July, where we meet again to share ideas. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us. Thank you very much, Dr. Obasri. And thank you once again, Dr. Um, Dr. Kudra Kopola should be expecting her fifty, uh, her five thousand naira <laughs> gift yeah. card. <laughs> she should Shortly. send her account to the um, to Dr. Baturi. Yeah, okay. we we'll, we will get that across to Dr. Baturi. Thank you very much, everybody, and enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.